So it's great. So I actually wanted to start with this reflection that Bob made me think of with his first story about the revolution, uh, which is just actually my favorite reflection of contextualization, you might say, or a little bit of interconnection. So uh, as you sit here, just for a few moments, see who comes to mind as having played any role at all in your being here in this room right now. Just see, yeah. <laughs> just see who pops up. Maybe somebody uh, gave you a book or read you a poem or told you about their practice or about this place or maybe long ago somebody inspired you to think differently or just see who comes up. None of us really were driving down that road, whatever it is, and saw the sign for <laughs> Panther Kill Road. <laughs> I thought, I think I'll turn up there and see what's there, right? We're all here because of conversations and interactions and relationships and encounters. This moment in time, like every moment in time, is like a confluence of all these things coming together. So who comes to mind? Sometimes I do this reflection and I think about the Board of Regents of the state of New York, which gave me a scholarship, which was how I was able to go to college. And that's, of course, how I got to India, was through this, this university program. Because they're part of why I'm here right now as well. And sometimes Did you take I do. Did course with Dr. Inada, Kenneth Inada? I think so. He taught in Arjuna. At the University of Buffalo. I didn't take a course in Nagarjuna. I took like, I just took a... No, he would do a survey course. Yeah. That was his research special. I took a, you know, intro to Buddhism. Yeah, that was in yeah. Kenneth Inaka, mm -hmm. Japanese American. Right. So let's put him in the mix, <laughs> prominently. <laughs> Where I first heard about things like the Four Noble Truths. Or... I, have, I have a friend who took a survey course in Buddhism like that. And Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and they were talking about emptiness or something, and then she suddenly had the experience that she was, in addition to being in her body, she was also the chair she was sitting in. So she, just from hearing about it. So she decided there was something there that she would like to investigate. There you go. <laughs> and so in addition to these, like, kind of very, um, inspiring figures, you know, like sometimes I do this reflection and I think about the people whose actions have really hurt me, not just the ones I find kind of irritating, but think about those times where I felt like I've been on the edge, like I've got to do something or I won't be free of this, right? Because they're in some funny way a part of my being here right now as well. So. Who comes to mind? Good.
Okay, thank you. I love doing that reflection. I do it nearly all the time. And, um, it's just such an interesting remembering, right? That however alone we might feel or cut off we might feel that really our lives are part of this but a larger picture of life and this larger flow. So now I'm going to think about your friend, you know, right. the uh, Mexican guy, oh, you know, because yeah, like, yeah. who knows, you know, there's yeah. that, that thread that somehow, it's only been twice, uh, it's like truth in advertising, where uh, once I was teaching um, this place, it doesn't exist anymore, it's called Charlotte's Place, it was part of Trinity Church way downtown in Manhattan. And uh, it was like a drop-in center, and it was this great room with large plate glass windows on, onto the street. And, and I was teaching there, and I did the reflection, and I said, as I said here, kind of basically, because I'm sure no one was just like walking by and thought, I'm going to go in there. And at the end, this woman came up to me and said, lecture. I was just walking by. <laughs> and I looked inside, and I thought, I'm going to go in there. <laughs> So I thought, okay, that's one little ding in my theory of reality. But, um, then I was teaching somewhere, I was doing a benefit for uh, preschool, which in uh, some other town, and um, the preschool was in the basement of a church, and so we were using the church uh, for the evening, and I guess it hosted a lot of other school functions, because I did the reflection, and said that line, the equivalent of that line, and this woman came up to me at the end, and she said, well, I'm only here because I thought tonight was the PTA meeting, and I got the wrong night. <laughs> but those are other causes and conditions, you know. Uh, she stayed, right? Um, but really, you think about it, you know, this, this sense of being uh, so disconnected, and compare it to the reality which is that our lives are all about connection of one kind or another. And consider what the amplifications or the manifestations are. That actually also used a quotation or an image that Bob has used. I learned it from Bob. I'm sure I use it many more times than he has, but uh, where he said, imagine you're on a subway and these Martians come and they zap the subway car so that those of you who are in the car can be together forever. <laughs> so what do you do? If somebody's like freaking out, you try to calm them down. If somebody's hungry, you feed them. It's not because you like them necessarily at all or you approve of them or you want to see them like the Lord of the subway car or anything. <laughs> but you're going to be together forever. Your lives are tied together. Right? It's not me versus them, realistically. It's us. That's how things are. So guess what? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Our lives are tied together. It's not a question of liking or approving or you know, it's understanding. This is this is like the reality. It's like a, the constructs we hold, which can be useful in an ordinary exchange. But if we hold to them rigidly as absolutes, uh, they completely lead us astray. Like self and other, us and them. You know, when that becomes this kind of concretized. Uh, reality, we're sunk, because it's not true. It's not going to be that, you know, we get to pick and choose. And it's interesting, I think, our time in the, in the light of um, the information is actually there, you know, through <coughs> economics and science and uh, environmental consciousness and even epidemiology. We don't live in a world where what happens over there is nicely going to stay and it's not going to affect us over here. And that what we do here is going to be contained somehow. And it's not going to ripple out to affect those around us.
this. It's just not the way things are. And so, what is that responsiveness of the heart that recognizes that? So, one way of naming it is compassion. It's kind of like, woo, we're all in this together. You know, sink or swim. And so, your situation is not irrelevant to me. You know, I'm not somehow immune from this. And nor is mine uh, rightly held in isolation. So this was actually when I took that uh, Asian philosophy course way back when. Um, I hate to do the math. <laughs> A long time ago. <laughs> more than 45 years ago. Uh, as far as I can recall, honestly, it was sort of like happenstance. You know, I looked, there was a philosophy requirement, like there was a language requirement, you know, I had to do some philosophy course. Uh, I looked at the schedule, I thought, that's convenient. It's like on Tuesday. You know, let me choose that one. And it completely changed my life. Um, because it opened up the door to some possibility of really living differently in a way that I didn't have the tools, they didn't offer the tools, but I heard that there were tools to make that real, to uh, relate to pleasure differently, pain differently, and even neutral experience differently. That we uh, we can have and often do have so many weird relationships to pleasure. We started talking about this before. Um, the very classic one being holding on, craving, uh, reifying a situation, trying to be in control. I will keep this from changing. I will somehow defy the truth of change. But there are others as well. You know, when we deflect the pleasure, we're so distracted from the um, we don't allow ourselves for whatever reason to experience the pleasure. And there are so many conditioned and, and very distorted relationships to pain. Shouldn't be here, it means I've lost control, this is embarrassing. I should never, ever, 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 ever reveal that it hurts. Um, if someone else is suffering that's displeasing, then somehow light upon the landscape, you know, <coughs> let's just tuck them away somewhere, um, or call it something else, not recognize it as a state of suffering, and, and so there are many uh, distorted relations, many, many distorted relationships to our own and to the pain of others, and then uh, there are even kind of weird distorted relationships to neutral experiences, sort of ordinary repetitious, routine things that are part of every day, where we usually go numb, we disconnect, we go to sleep, we wait. We wait for something more intense to happen, either pleasurable or painful, so we can come alive, so we can feel alive. I think it's in this light that uh, perhaps that, um, this is a quotation from the Buddha, that um, one who is uh, heedful or one who is mindful is on the path to the deathless. One who is heedless or one who is mindless is as if dead already. You know, we, we are so numb and disconnected so much of the time. So this was the, like the training prospect. You know, that there were things we could actually cultivate that would change our relationship to pleasure, pain, and neutrality, and therefore our whole lives. So, if I went to India, um, based on that. So, and particularly around the relationship we have to pain, whether our own or someone else's, this issue of compassion uh, becomes so prominent. And what's it like, you know, if you're on that subway car? Come and they zap the subway car. 
and there's someone there, you know, you kind of been waiting for them to get off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but they don't look like they're having a really good time. And you suddenly realize we're in here together. And that's going to last for you. What is that possibility of relationship that isn't like, you know, phony? It isn't like saying, I so appreciate what you're doing. <laughs> and maybe that's very far from the truth. Or, please continue on. Um, or, but is genuinely formed in that recognition that we're kind of in this together. Uh, and is responsive in a way that acknowledges the suffering that seems to be the genesis of this action or you know, spate of actions, whatever it is. And is also not, not weak or giving in. So Bob and I taught a number of workshops um, called, usually called Fierce Compassion, which became the basis for the book we wrote together, which was Love Your Enemies, which I personally think is a book that I hope come back. <laughs> Even though it was some years ago. Uh, what in the world does that mean? So, compassion. Um, uh, again, you know, going back to the, the Burmese tradition, one way it's defined is the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's a movement of the heart and it's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. Right, so there's this, this sense of not just like laying back and feeling bad, you know, it's this movement toward to see if we can be of help. And it's also not, it's distinguished from a movement into to burn up with someone else's pain, right? However uncomfortable or poignant it, we might feel, we still have some basis for not um, being completely defined by someone else's suffering. Otherwise, we're not really that much help, even potentially. So qualities, I'll also go back and you know, just say again, qualities like love and kindness or compassion are considered qualities of generosity, like generosity of the spirit. And like any gift, you can't determine how someone will receive it. You can't insist, well, respond this way. You know, put on that sweater right away. Tell me that book is the best book you've ever gotten. Um, tell me it's not going on the pile of unread books in your house, right? Our work is in the giving. That's all we can do. And we can learn skills in giving as well. You know, take the book and hurl it at someone's head, or you know, whatever. Or you try to say things in such a way that they're more skillful rather than less skillful. And we'll keep talking about that uh, tomorrow as well as we go into the topic of equanimity um, and change and being out of control, things like that. But uh, in terms of the intention. Um, within our own hearts, so the motivation that's guiding us, it can be around uh, much more of a sense of a freely given gift, right? This is my, this is my offer. So compassion, and these days, um, kind of some research circles and, and some Buddhist circles, um, there's actually this distinction that's sometimes being made uh, between the term empathy and the term compassion, not in ordinary language, and they're, they're used very much the same, but um, it actually started around a presentation, I think that was uh, being offered to a group of people, including the Dalai Lama, about some research finding, and the very common term that everybody uses pretty well, uh, compassion fatigue came up, and I understand if you write in compassion on Google, 
compassion fatigue will come up as a suggestion because it's so commonly searched for. So somebody used the term compassion fatigue and, and his holiness to the people around him, like Matthew Ricard, who's there, who's a French man who became a Tibetan Buddhist monk, they started laughing and, you know, it was, when Matthew suggested, he said, well, from a certain point of view in Buddhist psychology, you might call it empathy fatigue, but you wouldn't call it compassion fatigue. Compassion is the resolution. So, and this again, of course, it's not the way we commonly use language, but the reason for that is, um, well, there's also, also this neuroscientist named Tanya Singer in Germany who says she's actually found different regions of the brain for empathy and compassion. And so what psychology describes it as is uh, we have this moment of empathy, really sensing into someone's difficulty, stress, unhappiness, um, and that is essential. And this, I would say, is a country, even a world that's sorely lacking in that. You know, so it's essential that we more and more get that kind of sensitivity and um, recognition and resonance, you know, real ability to, to resonate. And at the same time, from this, in this model, empathy would be considered a necessary but not sufficient condition for compassion to arise. And the way, so what the research scientists say is, or psychologists say, is maybe we have that very genuine moment of empathy, which we need, but then uh, they would say, then we over-identify with the person. It's not just um, a sense of what they are likely going through, but we dive right in and we're overwhelmed. And then we over-identify, and so that way they say empathy leads to empathic distress. And our own distress, our own state of overwhelm, our own unhappiness takes center stage, ironically. And all our energy is going to that. So the way I usually describe it um, is this kind of sequential thing where we have this moment of empathy, which we absolutely need, and we sense into the difficult state of this other person or a group of people. And then we are frightened by that, and we want to run away but we're just exhausted. We feel we have nothing inside of us to respond. We're so overwhelmed. But we're blaming. You know, I gave you perfectly good advice six months ago. If you'd only listen, you wouldn't be in this terrible situation. <laughs> or we get into that strange, egoic fixation we can get into, like, I'm going to be the one to save you. You know, here's your list. Everything you need to do to be safe by me. Um, or we can have the compassionate response. And for a while, I was trying to uh, school myself not to use the word compassion, to say the compassionate response. But that didn't work. Uh, but that's what it actually is. It is a response amongst many possible responses. Even if we have that moment of genuine feeling into. And certainly there are lots of times when we don't have that moment. You know, so there's another whole kind of opening that needs to happen. But I think I got into that. Um, uh, I took such an interest in that because I found myself working, as many of you might be, you know, with people who really are taking care of other people in some way, either professionally or personally. Or people who just, by their nature, by their training, have an awful lot of empathy. You know, that's not what's, what's lacking, but they're burning out for some other reason. And so, uh, as admiring as I've been of, of the emphasis on empathy training and all of that, I haven't really felt as moved to um, participate in that as I have I'm looking at this other place. Like, that's interesting. What else has to be there? for compassion to be full on. So the implication is that compassion has within it a kind of stability. It has perspective, even as it is responsive. 
Um, years and years ago, my friend uh, Joseph Belsin and I went to the Soviet Union to teach, and it was still the Soviet Union. And we were told as we were leaving that it was, well, we knew that kind of anyway, but uh, it was illegal to teach meditation <coughs> in the Soviet Union at the time. So uh, we went as part of a tour group. And we even brought Joseph's mother as kind of cover. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we were told just before leaving that it was really important, you know, not to disclose this. So um, every afternoon when everyone else would go off to a museum or something, Joseph and I would disappear and we'd go off with a translator to someone's living room. And we would just teach. And I, I found myself, you know, in different places uh, every afternoon. So. I found myself talking about compassion a lot, and I kept thinking, you know, there's this really funny feeling in the room. And so finally I sat down with the translator and I said, when I say compassion, what do you say? <laughs> and they said, oh, it's this state you are like broken, and you know, shattered, and they said it's like, Someone has taken a giant stake and driven it through your heart. I thought, no wonder there's a really funny feeling in the room. You know, but we can be there, right? We can go to lots of different extremes. Being cold and indifferent and not caring, but also that extreme, right? Where uh, it's too much and we're too over-identified. We've lost perspective. We are now as defined by the situation is the person undergoing it. And we don't have the energy to really, in a sustained way, be there. We also have no space, right? There's not a sense of like, well, how about this? You know, or even, it doesn't even have to be verbal, you know, in the sense of giving advice, but just in one's being, right? Manifesting something other than the the particular thing going on. So what are we really offering? Like, where's, the, where's the wisdom in there? So this is a challenging, you know, um, long-term kind of exploration uh, from the beginning of looking at those roots of interconnection uh, and reformulating our vision of life, our worldview in that way, to understanding the sensitivities and the ways we need to open to one another and listen and including to ourselves and you know recognize pain as pain um, and then you know with ourselves that starts with looking at our own fear and greed and jealousy and all those things we don't really like that much and seeing if we can recast them like reframe them instead of calling them bad and wrong and terrible terrible, terrible qualities, you know, consider them as qualities of suffering. They're causing us suffering now, they're on with leading into more suffering. What does that switch do? And then we do that with others as well. All the way to where is that basis of stability? Where's the perspective that can accompany uh, our compassion, our compassionate efforts, and where does that kind of wisdom get uh, engendered and nurtured, and how can we have it tied into compassion all along the way, so that uh, we don't burn out, and it doesn't become just about us and our, our discomfort one more time. So, here we are. You know, that's, that's compassion, and the reason that uh, all those workshops were called Fierce Compassion was because the, um, you know, if you think of compassion as having a stake driven through your heart, it's like, first of all, who wants to go there? And second of all, you know, it doesn't sound very effective or powerful as a, a means to an action. And so there are a couple of things that are, are really, I think, great myths about Passion and prevalent in the West. And one is um, that it's it's something weak. You know that it will make you gullible, make you a sap, make you a doormat. Um, it will uh, cloud your your visions 
to that, you know, I mean, years and years and years ago when I was working on my first book, Loving Kindness, that was a lot of years ago, more than 20, um, yeah, the, uh, I, I read this interview in Time or Newsweek um, with a this former beauty queen, she was Miss Kentucky of like the 50s or something. And Miss Kentucky was asked what she had to say about life. So this is like, you know, 30 or more years after her reign. <laughs> and she said, I'm so tired, I'm so tired of smiling. <laughs> and you think about like 30 or 40 years of like completely meaningless smile, you know, totally vacuous, disconnected from any inner reality. And that's the fear that we have, you know, like we're going to be boiling inside in some injustice and we're going to smile, you know, that Ms. Kentucky smile because we're trying to be you see, compassionate and all concerned. It's not like that, it's a power. Uh, but that is very hard to come to. Except, first of all, experientially. Um, and through recognizing that what gives something like compassion its power is its alliance with reality. This is how things are. We are connected. Um, that responding out of hatred uh, may have some short-term satisfaction, you know, in its energy, but usually is not the best judge judgment or, you know, set of options and so on. So how do we challenge that? You know, really take a look. Is it that weak? Is it that stupid? Uh, do I become this Kentucky, really? And then another great myth, which is sort of uh, prevalent and really forms a lot of what my work is countering, is this idea that it's Qualities like love and loving kindness and compassion are sort of like gifts, you know, that the idea that they are trainable, or Bob would say educable, um, you know, it seems weird. And I understand it's weird, you know, it sounds so cold or mechanistic, like I went for a five-day retreat and I came out compassionate, you know, or even my degree in loving kindness, my doctorate from that, you know. Uh, it can sound kind of weird, but it's not cold or mechanistic in that way. It's really uh, countering the notion that we tend to have, which is that something like compassion is a gift, and if you don't got it, you don't got it, you know? And, uh, it's recognizing the roots of something like compassion in awareness, how we're paying attention, uh, in wisdom, and so on, and realizing all those things are completely trainable. And so it is very much in our hands how we cultivate or don't these nascent abilities, how we bring them forth into our lives, or don't. Um, it really is, in the end, like it is our responsibility as we as we go forward. So, what do you think of when you hear the word compassion? I'm very curious if we have a microphone. Um, I you can make Justin answer that. too compassionate and more about not having meaning in the work that you're doing. 
Um, so I don't know, that was just a thought. But, um, so I guess some of my um, questions are, kind of how would you give advice about common pitfalls that people run into when they get into fears about delivering compassion? One being kind of actively giving compassion, you have to do something versus kind of just sitting there and listening or just being there with the person. And another big one is kind of the fear that this will drag you down into kind of your own spiral of sadness. Um, first, the response to the thing about meaning, I think you're absolutely right. And sometimes uh, what's both revolutionary and essential is uh, recapturing the place where we find the sense of meaning. You know, so if the meaning uh, we derive from a job, say, is in metrics, you know, this many people uh, found homes, you know, or whatever. That's one thing, but if the uh, sense of meaning we get derives from our own motivation, like, I, I listen that much more carefully. Or I resolve to uh, really treat everyone with respect, no matter whether they're a client or a customer or whatever. Um, that's a very different source. And it's a very different result. Because even as we work toward those metrics, because that's the job, um, there's so many other factors involved. That so for example, when I, uh, is after I wrote Real Happiness at Work, I was doing a workshop somewhere and somebody raised their hand. And she said that um, she was, uh, she worked in a call-in center fielding, fielding customer complaints. Mm -hmm. And she said, I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, because I decided to love everybody. Good call. She said, I treat them all with respect. And I can't always help people. By the time they get to me, they've talked to two or three other people. They're freaked out. She said, but I treat everyone with respect. I really am honest. If I say I'll get back to you at 2 o'clock, I'll get back to you at 2 o'clock. And she just went on. She was like radiant. And I was like, wow. I, I think it, at the time of the workshop, I had just recently been a complaining customer uh, myself. You know, and it was not that kind of exchange. And, and yet, you know, here it is. Like a job that very possibly was not her dream job. You know, she was finding that sense of meaning in, the, in what she was bringing forth in it. So I think that's really true. And I think, you know, in terms of the questions you ask, it's like it's made much easier when there is some kind of collective uh, work, either at the workplace or amongst people with the same values, or, you know, if there's leadership at the workplace that is um, encouraging those kinds of questions. Um, because it's, it's a process. Um, there's, uh, I mean, there are many times in my own life and certainly some significant times where I've been trying to figure out how to help somebody, for example, and, um, and there was one time where I was uh, in that situation with a friend who <clears throat> was really very kind of endlessly depressed, although uh, he's much, much, much better now. Um, it seemed like that day would never come, and I went to a uh, Tibet teacher of mine, Sonia River Jade, I basically said, how can I help him? And his advice, more or less, was stop trying, just be there. And it was very interesting, because it didn't mean, and this is very subtle, you know, it didn't mean give up, it didn't mean ignore him, it didn't mean stop visiting, it didn't mean any of the things we might take it to mean. It meant just be there. And stop trying to fix it and see what emerges out of that moment. And it was very interesting because I wouldn't just be there. I was in the hospital. And uh, it was interesting to see people come in out of like the greatest love, you know, and appreciating that. But sometimes there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of like, you know, take 15 drops of this tincture and you'll be fine in a week. Uh, which was also very generous, but I could tell the 
internal experience he was having was one of being pressured. What if I fail? What if it doesn't work? Then I failed you. Then I have to, you know, uh, which doesn't mean never offer the drops, but there are different motivations we have in the offering. And sometimes if we're just there, what emerges out of that togetherness is a more helpful kind of offering. Then, you know, and I've just seen that over and over and over again. So uh, it's very hard for us because the words imply give up, don't be there. You know, be there and think about your email instead of really be there or whatever. Uh, but it doesn't mean any of that. And so it is, that's why I said the collective, you know, it's like when people have that kind of experience together and can relate to one another, that is a very healthy, healthy way of understanding. Well, you know, I went to that extreme. The other part, which you know I talked about earlier, um, is that it's very hard uh, to find a balance and to recognize that balance is important. So, um, I was part of a four-year program for domestic violence shelter workers, this <coughs> other uh, institute, the Garrison Institute, and. We were bringing tools of yoga and meditation to frontline workers, and then uh, directors and supervisors or shelters were, were sort of wanting programs as well. So um, we started a parallel track. So it was somewhere in there that uh, the women, the people who were directors and supervisors themselves, came up with this phrase, which I really liked, which was culture of wellness. They wanted to help establish a culture of wellness at work. And everybody, well it was interesting, for everybody that meant a physical space of some kind where people could just chill. But then there were things that were very different, you know, for each person. And, then the, and the nature of the culture, the domain of the culture might be your body and mind. It might be your desk. It might be your office. It might be your you know, your entire workplace. So this one woman said, in that vein, you know, that effort to establish a culture of wellness, she said, I've decided that from now on, I'm going to take a lunch break. And everyone in the room who did not work at a shelter was completely aghast. We said, you don't take a lunch break? Like, is it in your contract? And she said, oh yeah, it's in my contract. It's never enough time. There's always somebody who needs me. There's always something going on. Everything is urgent. But, she said, I realize I can't go on in a good way unless I actually shift that and I take a, a lunch break. So it was really interesting because we were meeting in between retreats and so we got a chance to hear her, her you know, narrative as it went on. So the first time she came in, she said it didn't work. She said, I closed the door but somebody crouched down and looked through the keyhole. <laughs> so, there. so I didn't get a break. And maybe like three weeks later, she came in and she said, it worked. I closed the door and I shut off the lights. <laughs> and I had a lunch break. Uh, so I realized, wow, you know, most likely the most difficult point in that whole story was realizing it was okay to want that, to need that. You know, and then, I don't know how much support she got for that, but she did it. Um, so it's something like that. Can you, can you mind speaking to what if, sorry, um, what if the culture you're in is a culture of workaholics? And there, and the culture is also, if somebody, in terms of compassion, as opposed to processing it, it's like, you know, blaming that person, person and saying, oh, what's wrong with that family? What's wrong with that patient? You know, <coughs> but they're putting this on us. How do you shift that? Well, I, you know, first of all, you probably need to find your support elsewhere. I mean, you know, the immediate support. Find it somewhere else, not necessarily look for it in, the, in your immediate workplace. But um, you can find that support, you know, with friends or, or people who share those values. And then, um, there are ways of communicating that are, um, it's almost like you do the best you can. I don't think about sh shifting an entire system, 
you know, I think about being authentic, um, which tends to have the effect of making for for change in, in those around. And, uh, you know, it's really, in a sense, all you can do is bring more of yourself and your authentic self to the situation. And it depends. So, you know, I was having this conversation with somebody before. It depends on what feels appropriate to you in terms of how vulnerable you want to be or how much you want to reveal. Or, you know, it's always different um, depending on your discernment. But, you know, there is a way of, if it feels right, you know, of saying, um, this is the effect this had on me. I need to chill, you know, or um, I'm finding this really hard. I'm getting really tired. I need to, you know, I'm going to try it this way. Or uh, I feel bad because I didn't listen to that family like I, as much as I now think I should have, you know. So is that blaming? Is that saying you people are such losers, you know, so cold? <laughs> or whatever, you know, but it's very personal. And that's why you have to see, does that feel appropriate in, in that situation? And sometimes, to some extent, it does. You know, uh, everything from, um, I don't feel, I mean, I've heard, you know, stories or everything from, I don't feel right uh, talking about people in quite that way. Uh, to, um, I don't think I really want to drink, to, you know, uh, this is my New Year's resolution, I think I'm going to try to do this, help me, would you? Some people look ill, or they're passed out, or they reek of alcohol, or you know, they're, they're different kind of conditions, and um, one is not equipped necessarily to take care of them. So you have to pass them by sometimes. And if someone really has a fit or something, then I think people naturally, and one wants to try to do something about it, do it for them. The subway example is just there really because it's uh, the, the main point about it is that we have one that has little to do with people on the subway. As possible, normally. You know, when everyone you want to read something, if you don't have something to read, that's a great thing about iPhones, you can always have to find something on your iPhone. <laughs> Otherwise, you're doomed to read those things up there. And you, go to, <laughs> you can go to this and that school, and you can get a job, and you can go <laughs> to some sort of thing, you know, in New York. And the idea that suddenly you'd have to confront, look at all the people in your car because you were stuck together. I usually don't use Martians, though. I, 
I make a national security experiment, and Henry Kissinger's voice comes on. Oh, well, now I'm, you I'm, will, I'm old. I haven't heard you use you it. Will be, you will be, you will be, you know, isolated for a long period of time. It's natural to <laughs> observe how you react. It's kind of, it's a matter of emotions. So, but it's a matter of shifting, and, and it's analogous to if you realize that life is infinite, your life is infinite. And that you, because usually we relate to lots of people in the sense that we're not going to really see them again, etc. We know it doesn't matter too much what really happened, etc. But if you have a sense of endless involvement with people, then you want to maximize and optimize your relationships to them. It becomes a normal thing rather than like an unnecessarily strenuous thing. You know? So that's the reason for the analogy. And it came up to me actually, I, I had the analogy being a New Yorker partly. Probably because I was asked to talk about why one would take the Bodhisattva attitude, you know, of, of living for others, as choosing that as some source of energy, actually, and a source of a source of not a source of fatigue and a source of like exhaustion and burnout, but a source of inspiration, and actually analyzing what does make you happy and satisfied and, and energized, and noticing that what you what the, one of the key points when you really are happy in life is when you're not thinking about whether you're happy or not, and what, you know when you're blown away by something. You know, and then you can do that right away by not thinking about whether you're happy and then being focused, into being distracted by focusing on whether others are happy. And uh, actually, you have a more vibrant and energized life in, in that case. It's not necessarily a job; it's just a, it's like an orientation. And being aware, automatically aware, therefore, of others' perspective and things, you know. I mean, it's not even Buddhism, it's like, or old English, put yourself in the other fellow's shoes, right? They have expressions like that, see things from other people's point of view. Actually, Shantideva is a famous teaching on that, which the Dalai Lama is the great inspira inspired by, inspires people about. And uh, there was a book in the 60s, and still existed in the 70s, but it's something called Cain Keys. Super bestseller. And he published it himself. In those days, you really needed a publisher, but he published it himself from Yale, yeah, something called The Foundation of Living Love in Tennessee. And it was called The Handbook of Higher Consciousness. And he mentioned Shantideva once in the introduction, but he never referred to Buddhism, he never referred to any kind of religious thing. And he called the teaching about seeing things from other people's perspectives. He called that the automatic consciousness doubler. <laughs> and it was a big thing that people did in the 60s, you know. In other words, stop in your interaction and then sort of see what the other person is seeing, you know, as a kind of a constant exercise. And that, that's why he taught that Bodhisattva spirit, you know. In, a, in Tennessee, it was a super best song. People really liked it. The handbook of higher. It's kind of a classic in point of printing of it. It's probably going to be valuable in another few decades. Uh, Ken Keyes is his name. And um, so that's a, you know, it's not, it doesn't matter what you do and how you do it. What do you enjoy doing, actually, is the key. You know, some guy, there's a guy who's really obviously a crack addict, and he's always hanging out in front of a, a store in front of uh, Columbia. Where the gates of Columbia is on Broadway, 116, between 116 and 15. And he's always over there. He's kind of like this. His eyes are like difficult. And he's clearly using something when he comes there. And, uh, you know, people get very offended. They're very annoyed about it. They scurry over the side and they go out there and they're whatever. And when he sees me coming, he really lights up. Because I have a, I have a practice with him. It isn't that I put dollars in there to be prepared, but did that I'd be good. But I have a thing like, okay, I go in my pocket, and the first thing I come up with, I will give. You know, I don't put back and make, t or can you make change? <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I just automatically do it. And a couple of times that's happened with like a 10 or even a 5. And someone else is walking with me because we're going down to, you know, have dinner or something. <laughs> it's a restaurant a little further down. And people get really mad, some of my Protestant colleagues particularly. <laughs> and they say, they say like, you gave him $10, you know. You couldn't give $10 to all these people begging. You know? I go, 
why are you doing it? Okay, you're very upset. And I, my answer always is like, well, they all didn't ask me for anything. B, I didn't intend to get $10. Usually I have ones in there. And I thought, I was hoping for the one that was the 10. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw the 10. Crack here on this one. <laughs> <laughs> a burger, baby. You get a burger in one once he gets his snore. You know? And it's a pleasure, actually. I feel happy about it. You know, I'm walking past a store, which is like a grocery store type of thing, but it's sort of fancy for the college community and the students. Everything is almost double overpriced. So they're, they're robbing you just inside, inside the window. And this guy is just like, you know, maybe somebody give him something. I enjoy seeing him nowadays. <laughs> sometimes they say, sometimes I'm carrying things in both hands. They look, man, I'm busy, and I go, yes, in mind. He's cool. He knows, he knows I'm good for his part. <laughs> and he lets me go. And so I don't dread walking down the street there, is what I'm saying. So what makes you happy is the thing. The thing. And then there's an analysis. The Shanti Deva thing is like an analysis where I give people what I call the Shanti Deva challenge. And then people think, like, well, what? They say, well, where do you really get your... Shadidev has a statement. He says, any pleasure that comes to you in life comes from wishing other people's pleasure and happiness. And any misery that comes to you in life comes from wishing your own pleasure, your own happiness. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and people get very challenged by that verse. If you don't mind, in class, a student think, what? Way. And I, I make it a challenge every year. I say, okay, tell me some something you had where you were really looking for your own pleasure. And then people come up with different things, and then you reanalyze what it is, and then they begin to realize, gee whiz, you know, when I'm thinking about what's going to give me pleasure, I'm automatically without it. Or even if I'm having a little fun, and I'm then thinking about how much fun am I having, that's the killer. Uh -huh. Well, not enough. I mean, it could have been like, could be better. Definitely, it really happens. But then finally, people come, especially the guys. They wait in on there, and then they end up with something about sex, you know. And uh, the brave ones, we have in class, and they come up with something about sex. About oh, that I have a great time because I want the pleasure. And then I refer them to a sex therapist. <laughs> And, uh, and that always usually creates quite a sensation in the flash. And I don't have a particular sex therapist, but, <laughs> but I say, well, if that's what you don't, know, maybe you're missing something. <laughs> but, that's, but that's a really, it's not a, a, a idealistic or do good thing, it's actually practical. You really look at it. You go to a museum, you see a Van Gogh, you know, and maybe at first all those crows and the sunset, whatever, right? And then immediately you're like, Oh, that weird guy, he cut his ear off, he inhaled too much turpentine, he was like, really weird, you know. And then, oh, it's a Van Gogh, I wonder how much he went to the mass auction, you know, like, how much the Chinese guy paid for it, whatever. And it's all boring, you, know, you, you hardly see the thing, you know. So, being distracted, like, you give a gift to a child, you know, at Christmas, your own gifts are really boring, you know. It's like her blue car, you know. You get a sweater, and then you immediately, at least in my case, I think about the boss. <laughs> okay, this is a gift to me and the boss. We're both going to enjoy the sweater in different, way, different ways. You know? I immediately think about it. But when somebody else gets something and they light up for a second, then that gives you pleasure. Especially a child. You know? it does. So what, just analyze what you get, what, what's really, what fun really is, what pleasure really is. And uh, you will find out that the compassion thing, it's totally, uh, totally uh, practical, actually. And I, I actually, do, do I have a little time now? Yeah, I just want to say one thing, and then yeah. I'll just turn it over to you. Sure. Well, when do we stop? We're almost stopping. Are we? Six uh, fifteen. Six, or do we go to six forty-five? We go to six thirty. Oh, oh, we have a little dinner. Yeah, because we don't have to oh, yeah. walk down the hill. All oh, right. So we go to six thirty, and yeah, then we'll have people come up and. Oh, because they did want to say one thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just this one thing, because in this light, something that. Um, can actually be fun. Is That's why I keep using the word experiment. It's like experiment with your own mind state. Like, um, Take a look at what it feels like when that crazy person, crazy seeming person, uh, 
just feels so alien, you know, so other. And depending on what inspires you or what you're moved to do is a kind of method, see what shifts that. You know, sometimes I will just start for a little kind of sort of remind yourself this is, and people say they remind themselves this is someone's child. You know, it certainly could be someone's parent. Um, <coughs> and uh, just if you play with that you, and keep paying attention, you notice that there can be a very different sensibility about the person, which isn't like appreciating their screaming or whatever they're doing. It's different than that. But that really cold, hard sense of like, you know, you're like way over there, and I'm like sealed off over here. That's what dissolves, you know? And so I, you know, I myself, because I'm just so used to it, would use silent phrases of loving kindness. Uh, but people do all kinds of reflections. Just, to, But it needs to be like in that spirit. I love that sense of something you enjoy. You know, uh, because it's not forcing yourself to change or, or something like that. It's like saying, wow, look at how much flexibility there really is here. And what's it like when I, that's actually my very favorite thing to say about loving kindness practice is what's it like? You know, what's it like when I wish you well instead of what I usually do? <laughs> what's it like? <laughs> Yes, Dr. Bob. So, so what I want to talk about is this light, which also comes up in the Shantideva challenge. Because, of course, one thing that Shantideva does that most people don't think, and that is that the human body itself, actually, in Buddhist biology, in Buddha's scientific biology, the human body and the, the shape and the form of the human being grows from compassion, actually. We are the type of animal that we are because we are like a mammal, for example, having the young inside the body of the more compassionate and firm the gender among the two genders of a mammal. You know, that's already a huge step beyond past laying an egg somewhere and burying it in the sand, you know, and hoping for the bed. You know, carry it in your own body. And uh, so the Buddhist biology, the human being is not the product of aggression, mighty hunter and all that. That's considered not correct by Buddha as a biological scientist. And I just wanted to leave you with this, and so I'm leaving it in this session. And, that, um, and I don't have enough time to really do it properly, but uh, karma. We hear about karma, and we think, if everyone thinks it's like fate, or it's some sort of mystical or religious thing, and it's not. Karma means causation, that's all it means. And I actually translate it as evolution, because karma, you know, <laughs> kar karma is, uh, is um, Buddha's discovery, in a way, of causation. You know, in the Eightfold Path of the Four Noble Truths, which is the actual therapy or practice or whatever that the Buddha taught, the first uh, limb of the Eightfold Path, the first branch of it, is called realistic worldview. And, the, in your, in, or you could even say belief. And so people say, oh, it's going to be religion, you have to believe something. But actually, what is it you're supposed to believe or have as a view? You're supposed to have a view of causality. It's a revolutionary thing to really accept the process of causality, and that you are part of the process of causality. Why? Because the, what the delusion that causes our suffering in his analysis as a psychologist, as a scientific observer, is that we think that there's something about us that is disconnected from all causality. You know, that's an unfixed, an unchanging identity that's in there that we have to kind of defend and promote and we answer to. And it's a source of drives that we can't resist and impulses and so on. This is all our problem, according to him. So to accept uh, causation as a reality means uh, even, even as a view is an immediate erosion of that sort of space that's absolutely apart from everything. That's the real me somewhere in there, if you follow me. And so, and karma therefore means evolutionary causality, right? So. What that means is, in a very practical sense, that Buddhist ethics grows from that. And because it isn't just the genes, and it isn't just the parents, and it isn't just the environment, and so forth. It is your mind. You know, what you do with your body, 
with your speech, which is a very important kind of action that you have, and with your mind, with your think even, shapes your life in this life. And we know that's true. If we think a lot of positive thoughts, we feel happier, we are like more contented, and therefore we have more smiles. If we smile more, that changes the wrinkles on our face and the expression that we have and so on. If we're frowning all the time, that shows up later on when you get older. And uh, uh, so everything changes us in this life, even though it can't change so dramatically what you have of a certain kind of body. But uh, then you choose, your next body is shaped by this and these actions. Because of course, everything is a collision. We are processes. So ethics, and then the ultimate goal is more and more connection. Because the more you connect with other beings, the happier you are, the more stronger you are, the more the, 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 the better it is, actually. The more you connect. The more isolated you are, the more demented you become, the more deprived you feel, the weaker you feel. The solitary punishment, which they use all the time in the demented prison system we have, is very, very damaging to people. So this is just a well-known thing. So then the, the, the Buddha's, Buddha himself, because of the evolutionary <coughs> state that he personally achieved experientially, is therefore the ideal is to be connected to everyone. To be that, that's the most blissful thing, apparently. But I guess you have to be blissful, because there's so many problems they all have. So to think to all of them, this has to be an overriding bliss that enables you to do that. You know, which, is, which is then when you really feel compassion, it's when you feel happier. And then you immediately observe how others are not happy. And then you would feel sorry for them that they are not happy, and, you, and your bliss wants to flow toward them. So that's the extreme. So then ethics fits right on that. For example, the three physical, ethical, what they call paths of action are to kill, to steal, and to engage in sexual misconduct. Those are the three bodily things that you shouldn't do. Positive things are to save life, to give gifts, and to have uh, benevolent sexuality, you know, beneficial sexuality that doesn't harm anybody. And um, either the partner or yourself or the family or anything is not harmful. And um, but think of what, how why are those three then chosen? When you take a life, you're saying that life had nothing to do with me. That person had nothing. That's the extreme way of alienating yourself from another being is to take their life. To just, actually, you can't destroy them because then they're reborn, and then they the, the next life that they find you, they don't like you automatically. But they don't they don't really know why. Uh, but because you killed them in a previous life. But in any way, the main point for you yourself, you know, this town's not big enough for the both of us, sort of type of thing. You know, you know me and Saturn the same can't exist on the same planet, you know. So you kill somebody, and then you diminish your connection to somebody if you took their life, right? You save a life, you know, then they become kind of connected to you. You've adopted them in a certain way, right? So you expand by saving lives, you contract by taking lives. Taking people's property, you know, then you don't care about their sense of ownership or their need for the object or whatever it is, and then you have something. But then you have cut yourself off from that person. And then sexuality is really critical, because in sexuality is where biologically human beings do connect one to another. I'm sorry, I don't need to really look at you all the time. Laura gets in the way. <laughs> so, so sexuality is where normally people do, beings do melt into one another, kind of. You know, they, they do go beyond the self. They identify with the beloved, at least ideally. And there's, there's sort of an underlying pattern of that, whether or not it's really achieved it all the time. And so to use that harmfully as a way of being more separate from another person, to just use that person as an object in some way or a dominator or something like that, is particularly that one point where and of course, the human being precisely, because the melting is very deep, and the human being sexual, you know, check out, you know, like elephant foreplay, it's really not happening. <laughs> or a crocodile, crocodile doesn't happen. So human beings can have much more experience, actually, in that sort of melting one another. And that's part cause of the, of the sociality, the compassionateness of the human being. So those three are selected by Buddha as a descriptive system of relative life in a practical way, so that by doing something good, by not taking a life and saving a life, then you've expanded your sense of aliveness, you see. So there's something in it for you. It's 
also altruistic, and then you didn't take that person's life or that animal's life or whatever it is. Something in it, for, but there's also something in it for you because you have now expanded your sense of connection. You have, you're a bigger being because you can identify with being that you didn't kill. Whereas when you kill them, you get more and more isolated, and then you project into others that they want to take your life, and you become more and more armored, and it's not good. Speech is similar. Lying, uh, causing division between others, you know, backbiting to make people dislike each other, and cause conflict between them, uh, uh, speaking meaninglessly, you know, just rambling on when you don't know what you're talking about, and wasting other people's mind space by blabbering to them in a useless way. It isn't really gossip, it's just speaking meaninglessly or harshly, using it, you know, speech as a weapon to harm people. Meanwhile, speech is a sacred thing, because again, speech comes for in an animal form, where you can share minds with another being, through speech very imperfectly. Words don't really necessarily convey everything that you meant, and they sometimes have great misunderstanding. But still, it's a way, when I listen to you, you know, you, I open my mind to you. When you listen to me, you open your mind to me. So therefore, we can share mind. We, even people who are dead, maybe read their book or something, or we hear their idea, we, we get a sense of their mind. And uh, imperfect as it may be, it's a marvelous, precious thing, you know, uh, speech is. And so to use it abusively, and the opposite is you tell the truth. You know, when you lie to someone, you imprison them in a false reality. And you, uh, you, you separate them more from reality. You don't care whether they're connected to reality. Etc. You deny what you think is reality from them, for them, and, and then you separate yourself from them. So, so those all fit in this: either identify more or connect more. In other words, in basic ethics becomes fits with this basic compassion idea. And finally, with the mind, you know, which is, and I always have papers from students, you know, on the Ten Commandments and these tenfold paths. It's called the tenfold path of body, speech, and mind. There's always seven or eight that are more or less similar. And then there's some that are a little different, but they actually have a kind of, they kind of fit. So it's a very ancient kind of thing, this is. And, uh, and, it, and the Lama has, has it in terms of a secular ethic. It doesn't need to have religious backing. It isn't ordered by God or Buddha or something. It's just practical. So in the mind, if you have a very greedy mind, and you just, everything you see, you want it, and you're jealous of other people having it, and you're, that's again separating you. You know, and the opposite being, to, you know, detached and generous and let them, enjoying that they have something nice, etc. And so those are the two things of connecting and disconnecting. And then malicious mind, you know. You know, I think the, in the commandments it's covetous mind, right? And they don't usually give you an opposite, but that there is the opposite is a generous mind. And then malicious mind, thinking of doing harm to another, and thinking of them as an object to be harmed, etc. Rather than loving mind, or at least patient and tolerant mind of how irritating they are. There's two sets of step to being loving. And finally, having a realistic view of the world and connecting to its reality and being confident that the more you know of the reality, the better off you will be, the more connected to it you will be. Whereas having an unrealistic and, in, and completely delusionary view, the more deluded you are, the more separated you are from where you are. So all the basic ethics, body, speech, and mind, three, four, three, completely encodes, you know, ways of being more compassionate, basically. And, and even the, the fact that we have this human form comes from having been compassionate in other animal forms. And wanting, therefore, to be able to more embrace another, identify, you know, we can hug people, etc. You know, if you have only claws, you know, you couldn't caress somebody, you know, like Mr. Lion, Mrs. Lion, they don't really have to cuddle you. <laughs> the paw, if they make sure the claw doesn't come out, but if they get excited, they might claw each other. Not cool. And a uh, human being has a soft thing, you break your finger if you're trying to scratch somebody. So we, and we don't have big fangs, you know, we're like wimps. Because we are animals born of connection. We, we, we became human, this amazing creatures that we are, by wishing the happiness of another. So even our body came from that. So his challenge, that's a good way. We went, some guy complains, well, I went to them and I wanted something and I was really happy to have it. But you're not, you get your blue car and you immediately were, actually I have a habit in my, my life to share it to make you, usually when I get a new thing like that, I usually bang it into something right away. Oh. <laughs> I do. And then I feel kind of relieved. 
it yeah. sounds like yeah. a movie. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to worry about the perfect thing. And just scratch yeah. it right off. <laughs> and and uh, I know it drops its value in case of resale. You know, and trade it in. It's an you know, discard culture, like industrial culture, but it sort of relieves you of having to keep it perfect. I know. It's too perfect. It's terrible. So, so I just wanted to leave you with that thing. It's a very practical thing. It's called the tenfold path of positive and negative evolutionary action. And you know, each one has the opposite. And it's a really nice thing to sort of get an idea of. And uh, you know those guys at Yale who are down on empathy and all this kind of thing? They, they're not only yeah. down on it, but also there's people who do yeah. studies and they say there's no altruism. Well, altruism really starts terrible. People who are altruistic just do it for selfish reasons. Like, that's wrong, that makes it wrong. But no, it's a win-win. If altruism benefits you, and you know, Sharon mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of thing that he loves to say, if you want to be effectively selfish, meaning get something for yourself, then be altruistic. Be a wise selfish, which means by wisdom, by intelligence, you understand that you get satisfied by helping another be satisfied. That's the greatest source of strength and energy and satisfaction, far from burnout. It's really meaningful to be kind to others, and it really benefits you. You know, as he says, the, when you take a bodhisattva vow, it's, unre it's crazy and unrealistic as it seems. I'm going to help all beings. You know, I'm going to take it uh, all. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to fix you with that and put you on a list and give you a pill. Doesn't necessarily mean that. It just means I'm going to want to take care of all of them. Then the Dalai Lama says, the first person that you succeed in making happy by wanting to make all other beings happy. Is yourself. You know, you feel happy. Something. Oh, I have a purpose in life. I want. To, I want to spread happiness. I want other beings to be happy. You know, and then you quickly learn. You don't go up and grin at people if you think you're crazy. <laughs> you know, then they will put you as the crazy person, like grinning on the subway. We don't really want to admit to ourselves in this culture how scared of happiness we all are. Your, your husband comes home, your maid or roommate, something, I don't know your status, I already stated, but your husband comes home, your wife, your friend, and says, I'm so happy. I don't know why, I'm really happy. <laughs> Are you pleased at that? I don't know anything. What have you been drinking? <laughs> what have you been doing? Are you okay? Are you going to have a manic crash in a minute? <laughs> Take it easy. <laughs> Not necessarily. Whoa, what? And then finally, if if, you, if they convince you that they're not demented, tem 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 temporarily demented, and they're not anything, and they didn't do anything wrong, which it probably takes a bit of convincing, then, for, then the next thing you feel is like, oh, what about me? <laughs> How come I'm not happy like that? And you feel jealous. So, you know, happiness, being really happy or something cheerful, is illegal, more or less, in our culture. Even though we say, when people say, How are you? say, Oh, I'm fine. Well, I'm great. Say it. And then sometimes, you know, if you want to be more brutally honest, like this one lady here, you say, like, as long as I don't think too much about it, I'm fine. That's what they say. Actually, Tibetans have a great thing they say. You ask, how are you? They say, Mashin Zabla. Mashin Zabla. Four syllables. Which means, just barely not dead. <laughs> Sophisticated way of greeting someone. So you have to say that to a hundred thousand people soon. <laughs> Maybe. They do. They do. So, so anyway, that's what I want to leave you with, okay? Practical ethics and how it's, 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 it's positive to be ethical. You know, look at someone who like, ripped off all their contractors. Going bankrupt 20 times and stuck in the <laughs> Is that guy satisfied? Is that guy happy? He's a gold plated, like weird tower there, like on top of a tower card. <laughs> Usually in that tower card, you fall off that tower. And he's sitting up there. And he's running around making life hectic for himself. Poor wife is sitting there and she had to like copy, like, like, like um, uh, what's her name? Michelle. Michelle. Speech. You know, it's a good thing of what to say. About something positive. What was he copying? Michelle Obama's speech. And, uh, and they're totally discontented. Although my wife thinks he'll be saying, 
<laughs> First time in his life, he will be subject to governmental housing. Will be what he will do. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll think it's a dump. And then he won't want to be pool playing because he can't own it. Oh, so it's, you know, it will all come back to you all the time. So maybe the drugs are going to get used to it. Raise, raise taxes. The way out. You're going to want to be there with the gold plate and fixture. And the massive dissatisfaction. Massive dissatisfaction. Restless dissatisfaction. That's it. So I'm sure it's time to move. Uh, we're going to apologize for leaving a day early. I didn't mean to. It was up until we're in bed. These things happen when you're a workaholic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are you going to do? What are you doing in India? What? What are you when doing? He, uh, the, his, the Dalai Lama is giving a 14 day teaching and uh, anointment, as it's really called, Abhisheka. People call it empowerment, is a wrong translation, actually. It's a, an initiation, you could say, in a certain, to a certain practice. But in this particular one, he always says, you people are not really capable of receiving this initiation. <laughs> and I'm not really capable of giving it. <laughs> he said, because I haven't really attained what you should have attained to give it, and you probably don't know the practice and the, the, you know, the method, and the, you don't have the mental stability, and the, you know, it's a very advanced, very, very high practice. But you know, there's a tradition where you, as a good omen, you give it en masse, you know, to people as a, to plant a seed in their, their karmic unconsciousness that some of the future lives and they really become a yogi or yogini of the, of the time machine, I call it the time machine uh -huh. uh, practice. And um, actually, I love it myself. I, I've been at least 20 times. He's done it for 34 times in his life. This will be the 34th, I think. And usually a Dalai Lama or a Pension Lama in Tibet used to give that initiation only once or twice in a lifetime. And he had a special thing once they were in exile. The, the female Buddha of the Kalachakra, Mrs. Kalachakra, whose name is Vishwamata, the Universal Mother, uh, she appeared to him in a dream and said, you know, you should give this a lot to the world, you know, type thing. Whether or not it's all right, don't worry, not everybody can practice as long as they have a positive attitude about it, you can do that. But what I particularly like about it, it's a, it's a form of the Buddha that is a male-female union form, what they call father-mother Buddha. And it has its body, both of their bodies are made out of time, units of time. It was Kala means time, Chakra means a wheel, and a wheel is like in English can mean a machine. You know? So it's like time machine Buddha, because the whole body, the organism of the Buddha form is, a, is, a, is time. And what I, I believe it signifies is that, you know, Buddha, before he became a perfect Buddha, he had a vow that he wouldn't attain nirvana and liberation from suffering until all beings had attained liberation from suffering. So then how do you attain Buddha? Well, the only way you can do it is if you, you reach a place, the enlightenment itself is a place where you're present in all of the future. So that the future is immediate to you, as well as the past. So time is not the, the illusion that time is only this minute going along like this and the future is inaccessible and the past is lost is undone in that, in that insight. And so you are there for everybody, your compassion, although you're free, you're com in, the, in, the, in what is a specific moment for people caught in the delusion of time and space, you're there in the reality of time and space, which is that the future is here, actually, really, or is here to you. And so your compassion makes sure that all beings in your field, which is an infinite field theoretically, uh, are making, having optimal progress toward their own experience of that themselves, their own Buddhahood, not anything less than, it's not like they're going to be a satellite to your Buddhahood, their own Buddhahood, every other being. And so then he shows, uh, he, he gave a teaching where he showed his body as somehow symbolizing that infinite presence in time. And that because some beings are just not ready, they can't sort of be, it's like you can't take a seed and stretch it and have a rose bush. You know what I mean? You destroy the seed. There's sort of an evolutionary time that is required for beings caught in a certain, they have to unravel their delusions and their, their alienation from themselves, from their own reality, in their own gradual way. And the idea is that there's an awareness, didn't create the situation, it's not omnipotent, 
can't just bring everybody instantly into enlightenment in their notion of an instant, but can instantly be at their optimal moment of enlightenment, after all the choices they make, and can be present compassionately with them to encourage them and nudge them toward the right choices and the best choices, the better choices. So it's a symbol of the ongoing love and compassion and connectedness of the enlightened Buddha of our era of 2700 years ago or whatever, Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha is the name, Gautama Buddha. So he's still with us, in other words. And uh, we, only, we, we, we can detect his presence through his teaching, through his <coughs> community of people who live by his teaching, through people like the Dalai Lama, through people like Xian. And the chair, as usual, I have to thank you for coming to Manila. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Teaching me lots of things. Oh, thank you. Uh, how to take care of the crazy people on the side. Don't leave them because people not. want to use sign books. So oh, oh, okay. don't run away. It'll just take a few minutes. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.